Hi, and welcome back to Drafting 110, Front Reading for Welders. My name is Anne Marie Harden, and I will be your guide through this course. Um, this week, we're going to wrap up with Chapter 2. So I hope you have read the chapter. This will provide an introduction, but you do need to read your textbook as well. This is not quite sufficient. So let me give you my screen. We'll tie through the slides. Whoops, sorry. Okay, so sketching is just drawing without instruments. In other words, we talked about the um, tools of traditional drafting. We talked about straight edges, T's, triangles, compasses. When you sketch, you have only an eraser and pencil and paper. So no straight edges allowed. Sketches can be important. Um, to very just quickly communicate information and ideas, but you almost always will turn a sketch into a drawing. Now lines are sketched. There's actually a technique to this. You sketch a line by first locating the endpoints, and then you start at this endpoint and you look at the other endpoint and sketch right to it. When you go from left to right, and from left to right and top to bottom, or straight down. You don't want to push your pencil up against the paper, you want to pull it down. And you know, if you're left-handed, this might change, but in general, you don't want to be pushing your pencil, you really want to be pulling it. Um, and once you sketch in a line, you can darken it if you need to, but you always draw your horizontal and inclined lines from left to right. And a lot of that's to avoid drawing your hand over the line because you don't want to smear your freshly drawn line with your hand. And that's why you pull down from light or pull down from top to bottom. We're going to talk a little bit about line types, but lines that represent object edges, you want to darken those and make them bolder than the other lines around them. Circles are sketched by marking off radii. So remember, we're sketching here. So what we're going to do is very lightly locate the center point of our circle. And then we're going to lightly draw in a set of diameter lines and lightly mark off the radii. And then we connect those marks because the human eye can draw a little arc consistently. But we have a hard time drawing a whole circle. And then you darken the lines you're going to keep, the object lines. There are different types of drawings. These are what we refer to as pictorial drawings. A lot of us, a lot of lay people will talk about these being three-dimensional, but in reality they are pictorial drawings. And there are different types. There's an isometric and an isometric is ISO means the same. So in an isometric, if you think about the vertical and horizontal axes, these angles will be all the same between the vertical and the horizontal. Diametric, two of those angles will be the same, and in trimetric, they're all different. So, um, Isometric is by far and away the most common. In fact, you can even buy paper that's got isometric grids to aid you in making isometric drawings. Cabinet drawing is a specific type of oblique drawing. An oblique drawing just means that you're looking at things at an angle. You can do one point perspective, which means you essentially draw the front view, and then you draw a single vanishing point. And if you think about Things get smaller as they disappear into the distance. That's what a single vanishing point does. This is, this is a really common way to draw a road um, or other things that are fairly simple. Uh, Two-point perspective, you identify two vanishing points and you just connect your edges along those vanishing lines. And three-point perspective, you have vanishing points in all three dimensions, left and right and bottom. If you want to know more about the types of drawings and vanishing points and oblique drawings, I encourage you to take Drafting 111, which is a draw, a course about actually 
drawing, and one of the things we do is we sketch some of these, and we do learn to create some of the sorts of drawings that we are talking about learning to read in that class. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of the specific types of drawings I just mentioned. Isometrics are a type of axonometric drawing, and they are, as I said, the most common. The thing to understand about an isometric drawing is all of the axes are separated by 120 degrees. So you can envision this little Y making up this corner right here. And so you've got a top plane, oh, uh, sorry, front plane or a left hand side and a right side. In a diametric drawing, as I said, two of the axes will be at equal angles. So this, whatever this angle is here, where the x's are, say that's 100 degrees, or say it's 140, these will always add up to 360, because that's how many degrees there are in a circle. So if this is 140 and 140, then this would be, uh, that would be 283, six. this would be whatever's left over out of 360. Um, diametric drawings can be somewhat more realistic, but more difficult to draw. And in trimetric, you can really change your perspective and draw from whatever angle is, um, makes the most sense, but it means all of your axes are at different angles from one another. Isometric is by far and away the most common, followed by diametric. Trimetric is pretty rare in technical drawing at any rate. As I mentioned, isometric drawings contain three equal axes that are drawn 120 degrees apart. So the axes, in addition to being 120 degrees apart, are scaled equally. Um, now, one of the things to be aware of in isometric drawings is that circles, this is a hole, it's a round hole, it becomes an ellipse when it is drawn in isometric. And this rounded corner also becomes elliptical. The easiest way to draw an isometric drawing is to start with one face and then project the other faces out. Typically, we don't always show hidden drawings in a pictorial view. It gets very confusing if we begin to show hidden lines. Instead, we use a multi-view drawings, which we will talk about soon to depict the hidden lines. And we will take apart the multi-view drawing in a minute. Obliques, oblique drawings pick one surface to show as a true view. So a true view is a view that is true to the dimensions. It's typically um, to scale, at least roughly to scale, re representatively to scale. So. For example, in this drawing, we would take the, the front face here, and this will be a true representation of the front view. And then we project lines back at a 45 degree angle from the horizontal and connect those lines to make the oblique view. There are two different types of oblique views, a cabinet and a cavalier. And the difference is in the scaling of the oblique axis. One of the most common tools that we use in technical drawing is the multi-view drawing. And this can be kind of confusing at first, but one of the best ways to think about it is what we call a glass box representation. So think about taking this this shape, this L shape, and putting it in a box, a glass box, and it's suspended magically in the center of this glass box. Call it the robes and Beauty and the Beast, if you've ever seen the cartoon. And if we then think about viewing different, say we shine a light from behind, there'll be a shadow cast on the front face. That shadow would be the front view. If we shine a light from the bottom, we'll get the top view. Now you notice this line right here. This line corresponds to 
this edge. So in multi-view drawings, you can get hints based on edges. So each line on the top view represents an edge that you would see if you looked at this object just straight down, is it? Just straight down. No, no perspective at all. All you can see is just the top of that object. So, and the, there are standard arrangements for these views. We typically only use three views. We typically use the front, the right, and the top view. So on a normal, on a standard drawing, when we're looking at a multi-view drawing, if you see only three views, there will be a front, and the right drawing will be to the right side of the front drawing, and the top view will be to the top side. Typically, these three drawings, together with any hidden lines, are sufficient to fully represent an object. Now, a hidden line represents an edge that you wouldn't see from the side that you're viewing. So, so think about this block. If you turned it so that you were looking at just the left end, you would see this, and you wouldn't see any edges because there's no, no cutouts on the left-hand side. But this dashed line right here, so we call a hidden line, and it represents the fact that there is an edge that you would see from the opposite side. Um, I will post some links, some other links, to resources for understanding multi-view drawings if this is new to you. Here's another example of a multi-view drawing. This is, so we're, we're looking at the multi-view drawing of this object right here. This is the front, the right, and the top. Okay, dimensioning is, as with anything else, standardized and important. You always want to understand how dimensions are to be read. Tolerance is a really big deal in technical drawing. You want to always report your numbers with the appropriate amount of tolerance because when you're machining an object, 2.5 inches is different than 2.50 inches. 2.5 would mean 2.51, 2.52, 2.53, those are all 2.5. 2.47 is also 2.5. 2.50 though, you better read 2.50. Um, that might be 2.503, it might be 2.498, but it will be 2.502 what we call three significant figures. Or this is a tolerance, this is tolerance to the hundredth of an inch, inch. We generally use decimal inches, not generally. We can use decimal inches or we can use fractional inches. This, on a decimal inch, the zeros are added for tolerance. On, if you've got a zero, so in decimal inches, there is no zero before the decimal point. However, if you're in millimeters, there is a zero before the decimal point. If you do not have a decimal, that's just a whole number. It's not for tolerancing. So that's just 50. It, it's not 50.0, which would be different. Uh, 2.00 is precise to the hundredth inch. 50 is precise to the 10 millimeters, one millimeter to the millimeter. Um, if you're using fractional inches, there's no indication of tolerancing, and you'll have to look at your general notes on your drawing to find your tolerancy. Unless, of course, you've got tolerancy noted right here. So this, this middle um, dimension is 6 and 17 64ths plus or minus 1 64th inch. Uh, generally, so we won't always include inches, or units rather, inches or millimeters. Generally, there will be a decimal, a general note somewhere that will state all units are in inches or all units are in millimeters, unless noted otherwise. Uh, we usually will all uh, we will 
specify angles either in degrees, decimal degrees, or in degree minutes and seconds, depending on the application and the vendor. Dimensions are read from the bottom to the top. So when we're dimensioning a drawing, I want to put our dimensions on the bottom and at the right. You don't want to cross your dimensions. You want to stagger them so that it is clear what is being dimensioned. And again, you won't be creating these drawings. You'll be reading these drawings, but it helps to understand how to read a drawing so, of dimension. So for example, this is a drawing that's not as clearly referenced, but it's, it's sort of legible. This one is better. This 1.75 indicates it is 1.75 units from top to bottom and from left to right edge. Dimensions are always from the arrowhead. So in reading this dimension, this 3.375, that would refer to this line here. Um, this is actually a very poorly referenced drawing on the bottom. You won't see many of these in this class. If you do take a drafting class, this is not good practice. Reference dimensions are not driving dimensions. They are placed in parentheses, so that's okay. Um, and what that means is if it's 1.75 from this corner to this corner and 3.5 all the way across, you know that what's left over is 3.5 minus 1.75 or 1.75. Those can be placed in parentheses. I do not see that very often. Typically what I see is more along this lines where just the dimensions that are driving are given. And again, we've got here a front view and a top view. Notice the holes, the edge of the hole is indicated as hidden lines on the top view, meaning that, and this indicates that that hole goes all the way through and it is given as a size right here. Okay. One of the things to understand about drawings is we really are talking a new language and then line types indicate information and have specific meanings. And this is one of the things you're going to need to practice in this class. And you may need to make yourself some flashcards. Thick lines indicate objects. So here's an example of an object line. I've been talking about hidden lines. Hidden lines are dashed and they show hidden features. This is that same object from a minute ago. It's actually this one with hidden lines. So the inside of the cylinder is shown as a hidden line. The kind of holes for bolting are shown as hidden lines to show that they exist, but you can't see them from the front view. A center line is a dash dot dash dot line and there are some standards around the spacing of the dashes and the dots. Both hidden lines and center lines will be thin compared to object lines which will be thick and a lot of times circles of many things are dimensioned from center lines so it's good to understand what a center line looks like. Dimension lines are part of a dimension. They are what indicate the piece that is being dimensioned and they will have arrowheads at the end. The dimension itself will generally be centered within the dimension line or sometimes it'll be outside the extension lines depending on whether or not it will fit within them. So dimension lines, extension lines are the pieces that attach to the object itself and then the dimension itself. This whole thing together makes up a dimension notation. Leaders point to things. So they call out specific features. They will often have arrowheads. They will typically be thin. So for example, this leader is pointing out to a one and a half inch hole that will be drilled through. Cutting plane, we're going to talk about section drawings in just a second. Section drawings are indicated by cutting planes and these are used to show internal features. So this is a cutting line 
AA, they will be labeled at both ends. And that cutting line tells us that we are envisioning cutting this piece in half right down the middle. And the arrows tell us we're going to look at this side, which is what we have right here. These are, this is an example of a section drawing. Section drawings indicate internal features. They can indicate type of material. They can indicate holes. This is a section of our part. It's as if we envision slicing it in half and looking at what is left. The shaded or hashed regions represent solid parts that are cut. So those are cut surfaces. Sometimes we need to break an object if it's too long to fit on our paper. And there are a couple of different ways to do break lines. We can do it with this kind of lightning jag sort of thin line. Or we can do a wavy freehand thick line. And what that tells us is, for example, this right here. We, we cut this and we broke it um, and gave ourselves some space in between the two pieces. Dimensions can show size or location. This dimension shows a size, it's a half inch hole we're drilling out. These dimensions show locations. They tell us that this hole is placed three quarters of an inch from the bottom. Extension lines will terminate dimension lines. So this is a dimension line. This line that, that connects to, or is close to, the edge of the object we're dimensioning is called an extension line. Leaders, like this one, will call out specific features, like this information about this hole. We don't want to use leaders in shaded areas. We want to only use our leaders across white areas, because when we photocopy, it might not show up. Surfaces are defined by lines. So if we think about this object here, its edges are defined by surface by lines. So this is the top part right here. That is a normal surface. We would also see this shape, which is this one. But we would also see a hidden shape which is the bottom. And if we look at this and turn it from the side, we would see these edges. And from the right, we would see this view here. Again, I will post links for the multi-view drawings in case you're struggling with deciphering these things. Holes are defined by diameters. So we don't talk about radiuses of holes typically, we will talk about diameters and this little this little line with a circle through it. This guy that you might be able to see more clearly in your textbook means diameter. But we will talk about drill diameters, core diameters, surface diameters, countersinks, counterbores, Notice the difference between counterboard and countersunk, and drilled and counterboard and drilled and spot face. All of these things are discussed in your textbook, and you will need to read that. Notice this hole is not drilled all the way through, it's only drilled partially through. We use hidden lines to indicate that. We also can indicate a deepness or a depth of that hole. We're going to talk about fillets and rounds. A fillet, and both fillets and rounds are used to avoid sharp corners. Sharp corners are known to break off and or cut people or things. Sometimes we don't want that. Sometimes we want to round them. So a fillet rounds an internal corner. A round rounds an external corner. Um, fillets, typically you add a little material to the join in the middle here. Rounds, you take off a little material. Fillets and rounds are dimensioned using their radii. 
So right here it says rounds are one eighth inch. Fillets and rounds are one eighth inch radius, unless otherwise noted. That means if you drew a circle here in this corner, it would be a one eighth inch radius from horizontal line to vertical line. Runouts are curves produced by a plane surface tangent to a cylindrical surface. So for example, this piece here, these rounded bits here are runouts. You've got this flat piece attached. These are called runouts. They're not fillets because they're on a cylindrical surface. They're runouts when they come from a cylindrical surface. Bevels and chamfers are related but different. A bevel goes from surface to surface, it's like a slanted edge, that's a bevel. A chamfer goes from edge to, or from surface to edge. It's like a corner that's been lopped off. This is a chamfer. As I mentioned earlier, section views show us internal views of objects. Section views can be all the way through. This is called a full section. They can be part way through. This is a half section. It's like we chopped out just that quarter. They can be broken out. So we can break off just a part and look at the insides of just one piece, like one of these guys. We broke off just that bit. Um, they can be offset. So the difference between A and C is A just goes straight through the diameter. Section C comes through and then jogs over, and that's what we would get. This is the section we would get through cutting line CC. And they can be aligned. Now, aligned is kind of like offset, but it's just on an angle. So they can also be revolved. So this is a revolved shape. And what we did was we just broke out a section here. And what this does is this shows us a side view with essentially an end view overlaid over the top. It's a revolved section. Conventional breaks allow the details of long objects to be shown clearly. So this is a very conventional way to break a round object. It's kind of this um, overlapping S shape. You see this a lot with round bars or pipes. We do this when our piece is too long to be shown on the piece of paper, but we want everything else to be to scale. Um, so we just will break this and then note its dimension as we've done here. So we've shown eight feet one inches in the space of a couple of inches. Um, we can use either the round um, kind of S-shaped break or we can use a jagged break line. Either one works. Um, it's, it's, conven it's convention to use the round one for pipes, but um, the jagged one works just as well. The whole idea of the break line is to indicate that this piece of the drawing, at least, is not necessarily to scale. And this little funky symbol right here is our first example of a weld symbol, which we will spend a lot more time with in later chapters. And so weld prints may use geometric dimensioning and tolerancing to specify acceptable dimensions for the completed part. Bear in mind, if you're a welder creating these objects, sometimes you have to place them, and you need to know how exact your measurements need to be. This says that you need to place this thing within six one hundredths of an inch of its specified location. So this is a this is an example of a tolerancing reference. This is where you would be measuring from. So be measuring from datum datum A right here, this guy. And here's another example. These are also welding symbols. OK. Geometric dimensioning symbols indicate relationships and tolerances. And I'm going to lead you, leave this to you to read. Um, I think it's all pretty self-explanatory. Concentric means that the two circles are nested one inside the other with, with center points that are the same. Um, 
this is just all really information that you need to internalize. If you're having difficulties deciphering any of this material from your textbook, please do let me know and I will help as I can. If nothing else, I can point you to additional resources. And I don't know what questions you have if you don't ask, so please do contact me if you have any questions. I'll see you again soon.